Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, children of all ages. Welcome to another episode of Who's the Pope? Two popes, one pope, a pope and a half, and uh, a contemplative and an active one. Uh, two popes in the Vatican, two men dressed in white, two men giving the papal blessing, apostolic blessing, two men called Pope. Now, this is from Father Z. He's, if you don't know, just research him. He's one of the most famous uh, priest bloggers on the internet. Uh, pretty orthodox. He originally started his blog basically translating the uh, into the or the the uh, the fabricated liturgy of Paul the Six is uh, you know the ordinary form, uh, the 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 deformed liturgy of Vatican II. He would translate the actual Latin text into the exact English translation because of the uh, prevalence of the uh, false English translations uh, in the churches with the the so-called English missals or French missals. So he would translate, anyways. So, um, but he t- it covers, he does that still, but he covers a ton of other topics. Now, this one he, he published uh, June 29th, 2021. And he delves into the question of, the qu- and the title of the article is, the question of two popes bothers a lot of people. Some thoughts. So his thoughts on the question. And I've done maybe three or four videos on the topic three two videos really delved into basically pretty much everything he deals with here um he does give but again now i'm a nobody i'm a little guy on on youtube but he's a you know a well-respected priest and actually everything i quote is doesn't come from my own opinion it comes from more authoritative sources anyway so uh so i'm gonna go basically through the whole article so you can go read it yourself i will go through it it's going to take some time it's a long article but it is an i mean certain things i'm going to skip because it doesn't really uh, i don't want to waste too much time on it um and then um there's one point he forgets about but anyways let's let's start so i don't want to waste too much time so the question of two popes so he starts off today is the feast of saint peter and paul 70th, ordin- 70th anniversary of the ordination to the priesthood of Pope Benedict XVI. Um, so, and he says, like, he gets a ton of questions on his comm box, you know, people asking, you know, who's the Pope? If Bene- is, you know, did Benedict really resign? Was it valid? If Benedict is really still the Pope, what happens to, if he passes away before Francis? You know, Francis isn't the Pope, and he's naming cardinals, how could there be a legitimate conclave, you know, in the future after Francis dies? So, he gets a ton of these questions all the time, which are legitimate questions. And you can see from the picture, here he is, uh, Pope Benedict XVI sitting down, and Francis coming and kissing the hand of the Pope. Um, well, they're both popes apparently, but... Uh, uh, the, uh, and, and when does this happen? When does this occasion in the picture here constantly happen? It happens after every time Francis names new cardinals, which are the Roman clergy. Uh, so he chooses new cardinals, he names them, he, br- he brings, he gives them the little hats and the different colors, and he takes all of them. Come on, boys. Come on, boys. Let's go see the Pope. Let's go see Benedict. So they all go. Uh, the cardinals behind him, I mean, other pictures, you'll see them. They're all sitting where my face here is. So they're all sitting, and they come, they all uh, kiss the ring, or sometimes kneel in front of Benedict, uh, John genuflect in front of him and kiss his hand. And they all sit down, and then Benedict talks to them a bit, and then he gives them the apostolic blessing. Or sometimes Francis and Benedict will bless them at the same time. So this shows you that every time Francis names cardinals, he brings them over to Benedict the 16th. Pope Benedict XVI, it's his papal name, basically to greet him and receive his blessing. Now, who's the real Pope now? Who's the administrator of the bishopric of Rome and who's the vicar of Christ? Hint, hint. Anyways, um, let's go. Let's continue. So, uh, 
so he says, I'll try to deal with these things dispassionately. Um, so he says, look, this situation today with Francis and Benedict, both in white, both in Vatican City, both seemingly giving the apostolic blessings, and actually Benedict actually writing with my apostolic blessing, I bestow my apostolic blessing right now still, is unlike anything we have seen in history. Uh, even Gonswine, the secretary, again, have a whole video on the speech of Gonswine. Um, he says, like, no resignation of Pope in the past, Celestine or not Celestine, or none of them, is anything similar to what Benedict did. Benedict did something absolutely novel. That's Gonswine, the personal secretary of Benedict for 50 million years, and he's, he re reflects the thoughts of Benedict, always. Um, anyways, so he says, this has never been happened before in history. Um, so let's continue. So he goes to Father John Hanwicki. Hanwicki, whatever, however he pronounces Hanwick, Hanwicki. He's uh, an ordin English ordinary uh, pr Catholic priest in England, so he has a good blog as well. I haven't gone to it for a while, but he links a story from uh, like a, a blog post from from Father John Honwicki there, uh, about the, on the feast of uh, St. Silverius, Pope and Martyr in 537 um, AD. Um, so the story is that uh, Pope Silvers, Silverius was the Pope, and then the Emperor comes in, deposes him, deposes the, the Pope, and installs, uh, what's his name here, he, he names him, he installs uh, another man, uh, does he say another man as Pope? And then what happens is this. Um, so basically, we have a living, valid Pope who is deposed illegally by the Emperor, and the Emperor's man was installed as Bishop of Rome, as Pope. Um, so, so, uh, and what happened is the the, the real Pope died. Saint Silveri Silverius died, um, and the other man, who is Pope, remained, continued uh, ruling the church until he passed away, and then uh, the election of another Pope came, and, and everything went back to normal. Uh, and he says, like, how do we deal with this situation? So, so. So he says, well, anyways, we're going to, he says, you know, some, some people wave away questions about two popes as invalid or an invalid resignation. He says, you can't do that because this is like in your face. You can't really ignore this, this question, which is right in your face. So he goes back to Father Han Hanwicki's piece and he says, basically, so he says, well, who was the real pope? Who's, who's the, so basically Saint, uh, not Saint, um, uh, does he mention it here? Why am I skipping ahead? Maybe I shouldn't skip ahead. Uh, is, as Father H. brings this possibility up, is it enough to say that whoever has his bum, has his bum on the seat, is the real Pope? Is that Good enough, or is he is the is he a usurper, an anti-pope, even though he has the chair, aka C. Um, I'll say it now because he will say it somewhere later. He says basically Dom Guéranger in his um, I think liturgical year deals with the situation. He says, well, um, of course this is obviously one is the real pope who was deposed illegally, and one was the the, the Bishop of Rome, the active, who is, uh, who is exercising the active ministry of the Bishop of Rome, this other Pope, um, to, oh, Vigi here he is, Vigilius, that's his name, Vigilius, was made Pope by the Emperor, uh, while Silvestris was still alive and deposed by the Emperor. Uh, so, so he basically, Dom Guéranger says, basically, okay, well, a solution to this problem is when Silver Silverius dies, died, one can say maybe that Vigilius, at least from that point onwards, after Silverius died, can be regarded as Pope. That's his maybe kind of solution. Like magically, the papacy goes from Silverius and gets stuck back to the Bishop of Rome. 
So, I mean, that's what's it. But anyways, here's the, he says, here's the mind exercise. Uh, say there are two popes. One of them, pope number one, was unquestionably elected Benedict, and unquestionably elected according to the proper procedures after the death of his predecessor, he is deposed or maybe resigns, uh, but under un a duress in a confused way. Another guy in these unquestionable and in, in these questionable circumstances is elected or imposed. Pope number two, Jorge Francis. And he starts and he starts to Pope. Francis didn't at first, and I remember that clearly, and he kept on refusing to call himself Pope. He never wanted to call himself Pope. He would always call himself simply as Bishop of Rome. Bishop of Rome. He never calls himself Pope. Even now, when you read at the end of it, most of it is Franciscus, just Francis. Most of the time, he doesn't call himself Pope. At the beginning, for the first few years, he didn't call himself Pope at all, just Bishop of Rome. Why? Are you not the Vicar of Christ? Actually, I did a whole video on it, and here he sees, as uh, Father Z mentions it, and he seems to have dropped the title of Vicar of Christ from his titles. Not only Vicar of Christ, he actually dropped um, the Supreme Pastor of the Universal Church, the successor of the Prince of the, uh, Prince of the Apostles, and the Vicar of Christ. All three titles he removed from the titles of, of himself, and he just kept it Francis Bishop of Rome in the last uh, uh, pontifical yearbook. And I did a whole video. Don't call me Jorge. Call me, uh, don't call me Vicar of Christ. Call me Jorge. Or my name is Jorge. Whatever the name I call the video. Something to that effect. It's probably the one which has the most view, <laughs> views on it. But yeah, he basically said, okay, these titles, Vicar of Christ, Successor of the Prince of the Apostles, Supreme Pastor of the Universal Search Church, I don't want them. Take them and just stick them somewhere else. And they're in small print under the, the heading of historical titles. They were historical titles. Nothing to do with me. All right. If that's what you want, Francis, fine. That's good. We don't want to give them to you. Um, all right, so... I'm just kind of skipping here because I don't want to be spending, you know, 10 hours on this thing. Uh, oh, yeah, here he mentions uh, Dom Geronje's uh, kind of s solution to the problem of uh, Vigilius and Silverius. And he says, well, we, you know, the, but it. it when it's proved that the church acknowledges in the person of a person uh, of a certain pope until then doubtful the tr the true sovereign this her very recognition is a proof that from that moment at least the occupant of the apostolic see as such as such uh, is as such invested by god himself becomes the vicar of christ and that's kind of a hypothesis we don't know maybe Logically, though, I would say no. Uh, now, he says, note well that the phrase, from that moment, at least. Until then, it's doubtful. Afterwards, it's magically certain. Uh, now, this suggests that there is a way in which being vicar of Christ and being bishop of Rome can be momentarily, at least, bifurcated, meaning split apart. And in Gonswine's... Uh, he will mention it now. And Gonswines, which is the personal secretary of Benedict XVI, he made a big, huge speech in 2016, and he published in a, a republished in a book in 2019 or 2020. And it has actually even a more clear um, insistence. It's like basically, he says uh, Francis uh, Benedict wanted to have an expanded Petrine ministry. An expanded ministry. He will. He changed the divine constitution of the papacy as if he has that power. Of course, he doesn't. Uh, anyways, uh, you can watch my other videos on the subject. Um, so, as far as the authority of the separated bishop of Rome, his jurisdictions, um, his jurisdiction is concerned. I guess that would have to be an amazing case of ecclesia supplet, which is, means the church supplies. According to Canon 144, in factual, re legal, common error, and in positive and 
probable doubt of law or in or, or of fact the church supplies executive governance for both the external and internal form so even if francis is uh, is in a chair he shouldn't be in and we kind of all agree on that that of the bishop of rome his juridical acts could be valid because the church supplies his jurisdiction the jurisdiction Hence, the, he can name clergy to Roman churches who are the cardinals who from the next who form the next conclave. So, therefore, the next conclave would be valid, whoever they would elect. Now, I would I would add to that and say that uh, basically, I would say that uh, Francis. Um, I am of the opinion that Benedict uh, most likely did not resign validly and therefore is the true vicar of Christ. And he kind of, he himself says, I didn't resign the office. <laughs> I didn't resign the, the office given to me in 2005. I just resigned the active exercise of the ministry. So I don't have the power for governance, but I, governance of the church, but uh, governance, but only the power of governance, but he maintains the power of uh, spiritual power or something like that. He himself said that in that his last audience. Um, and and Gonswein says Benedict did not resign, did not abandon the office of Peter. He explicitly uses these words. He, Benedict did not abandon the office of Peter. He just, which was impossible for him. That's what Gonswein's words. It was impossible for Benedict to resign, uh, to abandon the office of Peter. Impossible since his acceptance of the office. What he did was he uh, renounced the active exercise of governance of the ministry of Peter. As if, I don't know, is it possible? Maybe, I mean, if you're, it's like a president delegating his authority to a prime minister, okay, you run the, or a queen saying, okay, you know what, I'm still the queen, but hey, uh, prime minister, you run the whole, the whole shebang. Uh, but the prime minister ends, be, <laughs> ends up being dressed up like, uh, like the governor. But uh, so, and, and every cardinal, everyone chosen by Francis is brought to Benedict for approval, basically, or tacit approval, at least. Um, again, satisfying answer? Oh, huh, I don't know. Uh, now, here is a few questions about the legitimacy, validity of Benedict's resignation. If Benedict still is truly the only legitimate pope, and if he outlives Francis, what happens? Well, there is another conclave, and we are in pretty much the same position we are in now. More on that on, uh, later on. So if Benedict still truly is, is still truly the only legitimate pope, uh, dies before Francis, then according to... The, to uh, According to what Dom Guerin J wrote, so this situation be like a Silverius and Vigilius. So Francis would be a pope because he is sitting on the chair. So he ha whoever has his bum on the chair, uh, no matter how, uh, how he got there. This is because the church, quotation marks, uh, I guess the majority of the people, he says, especially the hierarchy and cardinals who elected him, say he is. Therefore, the church supplies. Now, I would say, if the if if this is the situation here, situation number two, where Benedict uh, uh, dies before Francis, so Francis is basically like any pope who dies. There's always I think it's called the Camerlengo, whoever is governing the Vatican city states and and uh, and doing all church business until a new pope is elected. So in my opinion, Francis would be basically not pope but kind of an administrator. So all his acts are legitimate until he dies, until another pope is elected. So in case he thinks he's still pope, so well, until he dies. And when he dies, then the papacy will be back, back into one person, hopefully. There are some, pe there are some smart people that is not the, that's not, not the end of the discussion. They have questions and not all the answers are perfectly clear. They keep on asking questions. So leave some leave the unity of the church for orthodoxy or sedevacantism, which is like we haven't had the Pope in like 70 years since Pius XII. Well, hey, about maybe since Pius XI, I don't know. 
and uh, so and there's of course since there are no and, and on top of it the significant is like we have no valid priests <laughs> no valid bishops no valid sacraments all right it's the end of the world <laughs> so go hide in your cave there with your magic priest and uh, um, <clears throat> and pretend you're a christian anyways and orthodoxy there is no such thing it's a bun bunch of different orthodox churches and i say uh, 90 95 percent of orthodoxy is true christianity um if you understood correctly um and he thinks these are very foolish foolish step escapes into fantasy fantasy land uh, so anyways we got the idea and by the way he says and he says this is like a gripping good novel it is. It's like a like a detective story, basically. He says, "Look, by the way, in the same years as Fran uh, the same year as Francis, who from 2013 onwards onwards usually only refers to himself as Bishop of Rome, he does that himself, and he himself removed the names, the titles of Vicar of Christ, successor of the Prince of the Apostles, Peter, successor of Peter, and uh, the Supreme Pastor of the Universal Church." Supreme Pontiff, he removed them from the titles which are associated with him as historical titles which have nothing to do with him. Uh, it's not up to him. Are you Pope? Are you the Vicar of Christ? Or you're not? If you're not, well, he relegated that title to a historical title. Maybe he doesn't think he is. Maybe he doesn't even believe there's a, such a thing. So, from 2013 onwards, uh, usually refers to himself as Bishop of Rome. Uh, ordered that the pa Pachamama Pachamama demon idol bowl be placed on the altar of St. Peter's Basilica. A thing hard to imagine a vicar of Christ or a true vicar of Christ doing. He also dropped the title of vicar of Christ from his own person and relegated to historical titles. As I said, not just the Vicar of Christ, but as well, successor of the Prince of the Apostles, St. Peter, and Supreme Pastor of the Universal Church. He removed all three, which are um, constitu constitutive, necessary part of the papacy. Um, and then I'm going to... He talks about Anne Barnhart, who, who talks about the ministerium and, 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 and Munus and Ed Maza, Edward Maza. Then we can watch them, listen to them. Um, oh, I gotta get my stuff here. And Ad, Edward Maza, Dr. Ed Maza here, he actually, when he talks, he talks, his, his idea is that uh, Francis, I mean, Benedict is actually tried to separate the, 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 the vicar of Christ uh, from the bishop of rome so bishop of rome is one thing and ben and vicar of christ is another because in the past like father z will point out like you know uh bishop of rome wasn't always the vicar i mean saint peter was in you know antioch he was vicar of christ and pope but he was in antioch so the bishop of rome was so he wasn't, uh, no, Rome was not the necessary, we're going to get to it. But he actually, one of the books he mentions is The the Mystery of Evil, Benedict Cease and the End of Days. And in it, it talks about the, uh, it's a hard book to read, honestly. I have to kind of, I wanted to do a review on it, and I found it really hard to, to absorb. But basically, it talks about the, you know, St. Paul talks about uh, the, um, the, the, uh, uh, the barrier or the the, the thing which uh, what's the word anyways it's basically the, the the barrier preventing the the antichrist when that is removed then the the apostasy will begin i can't remember the exact thing but he does mention that book which i just purchased it i wanted to go over it i found it kind of quite complicated but uh, maybe i'll do it one day um, anyways, so he just mentioned them. So it seems that in their view, so he says Benedict XVI did not legitimately resign. Actually, uh, what's his name? Uh, um, uh, one of the very famous uh, Italian priest, uh, bishop, I believe. Um, I did a video on it. Um, again, friend of Benedict. He says, uh, did Benedict actually resign or was it a partial resignation? Because if it was a partial resignation, it was no resignation. 
Um, and remember, Benedict did not resign the papacy. He does not say, I resign the papacy. I do. I resign the papal office. I resign. No, he doesn't. Uh, that's why he's still dressed in white like a pope. He calls himself Benedict, which is his papal name. Anyways, so in their view, that Benedict did not resign legitimately. Um, they say the confused language that Benedict intended to resign, the active dimension of his role. He actually says that in his last audience and in his resignation. His ministerium, for example, doing the stuff as doing stuff as Bishop of Rome and doing stuff as Pope to the larger world. However, he did not intend to resign his munus as Vicar of Christ, the office, the munus. Uh, and as I said, Benedict himself in his last audience, he says he did what he received on that day, 2005, that was always and forever. But he's now resigning only the powerful governors. And Gonswine, his secretary, says Benedict did not abandon the office of Peter, something absolutely impossible for him to do. But he resigned the active exercise of it. And it does an expanded Pichrine ministry. So he says much, uh, much, turns, much turns on the technical term munus. And this is a priest who knows Latin. So he understands better than me better than you, better than most people. The fact is that munus and ministerium do not mean the same thing. Let me repeat that to a lot of even traditional Catholics who got very successful um, online shows who originally were saying, ah, munus, ministerium, is all the same thing. It all means the same thing. It all means the same thing. They're connected, but does not mean the same thing. The fact is that munus and ministerium do not mean the same thing. And that's from a Latinist, basically. Though they are often bound together. For example, one carries out a certain ministry in the church because he holds the office, an office, a munus. So they are bound together, but thought they're not the same thing. A munus, canon law says that the Pope, uh, canon law says that the Pope has to resign the munus, which Benedict did not. He resigned the active exercise of the ministerium, of the functions of the munus. He resigned the active exercise of the functions of the office. He didn't resign the office. Canon 332, number 2. Um, there's the Latin there, and then it shows you here the, the munus, the office. If, if it should come to pass that the Roman pontiff resigns his office, uh, it, is, it, it is required for validity that the resignation be made freely, so if it's not free, uh, or under duress, and that it be properly manifested, so it has to be explicit, but not that it be accepted by anyone. But Benedict said in his, re said in the, his resignation, here he quotes what Benedict himself says. He has the, the Latin and then the English translation. Again, you can say ministerio, uh, episcopi, Rome, and then uh, that, uh, and he says the successor of Peter. So he is resigning the ministry of the bishop that he the, 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 that he received from the cardinals uh, on April. And this phrase, this phrase, this was highlighted in red, is exactly repeated in Benedict's last um, conference. And he says he never, what he received here, he never um, abandoned, and because it is always and forever. He only resigned the power for gov. He says, I don't have the power for governance. But this part, which basically the office he received in 2005, it's always and forever. And he actually has a video. I mean, there's another video. He says, Benedict says, you know, basically he thinks it's uh, uh, the papacy is a, uh, He's an ontologically pope, as if it's a baptism. He just kind of changed. Of course, it's not. It's an office. Anyways, and he renounces the ministry. Anyway, so he, he has the, here's the English translation. For this reason, no, we all we are all aware of for this reason, and well aware of the seriousness of this act with full freedom. That's what he says. I declare that I renounce, I renounce the ministry of the bishop of Rome. Not the office of the Bishop of Rome, 
contrary to what the Code of Canon Law, which is the law bound by, even the Pope is bound by it, to, to do. Successor of the Prince of the Apostles. Entrusted to me by the Cardinals on April 19, 2005. Uh, yeah, 19 April 2005, in such a way, and that's it, in such a way, that on 28 February, at Tura, the See of Rome, the, basically the bishopric, the bishopric of Rome, uh, the See of St. Peter will be vacant. And then the conclave will act a new supreme pontiff, meaning a pope, a, a bishop, a supreme bishop, will have to be convoked uh, by, by, by those who are in comp competence to do it. Words have meanings, uh, Father Z continues. It is not try to simply conflate munus and ministerium, as a lot of people do, it, uh, as if they are interchangeable. They are not. Um, they are closely tied to each other, but they are not synonyms, not even close. It is interesting to read the canon that introduces the figure of the Roman pontiff, the Pope. Uh, prime Apostle, first of the Apostles. Uh, anyways, uh, and here I'll just read the translation here. The Bishop of the Roman Church, in whom persists the office given by the Lord uniquely to Peter, the first of the apostles, and to be transmitted to his successors, uh, is the head of the College of Bishops, the Vicar of Christ, which Francis removed from his titles, uh, and even uh, uh, and the pastor of the Universal Church, which Francis removed from his own title, Supreme Pastor of the Universal Church on earth, by virtue of his office. He possesses supreme, full, immediate, and universal ordinary power in the church, which he is always able to exercise freely. Um, I'm going to skip some part. It says, This munus can be and must be NDUM, which is up here, transmitendum. Transmitendum. This munus can and must be passed to his successors. So this munus, the office. It goes from one bishop of Rome to another. If you can legitim if you are legitimately bishop of Rome, the munus is yours. Uh, it is reasonable to, uh, to assume that, th that the three things that follow in the canon are the results of his munus. Uh, they are to whoever is le the legitimate bishop of Rome, namely, number one, head of the College of Bishops, meaning supreme bishop, supreme pastor of the universal, uh, so, uh, head of your, uh, because head of the bishops, why? Because he's a successor of the apostles, prince of the apostles, St. Peter. But, but Francis removed that from his titles. Vicar of Christ, again, Francis removed it from his titles. Pastor of the universal church, again, Francis removed it from his title. He just kept the ship of Rome. Uh, and then now he mentions Archbishop Gonswine's speech. Now, if you click on his link, it takes you to, I think, a National Catholic uh, register where it's basically a very short uh, excerpt or commentary on the speech of Archbishop Gonswine. But you can search it. I think Aletea or whatever this website is called has the full, it's like three, four pages of the full speech of Archbishop Gonswine. And as I said, it's reprinted among other speeches in a book, or you can get it on Amazon. Uh, so don't read this little excerpt where it talks about an expanded ministry and very, very... Uh, uh, but, but the full speech where it's explicitly, explicitly says, Benedict did not abandon the office, the munus of Peter. Which was, uh, which he received in two thousand five, which is was Im which is impossible for him to do, and that's he's talking three years after after his, uh, Benedict's so called renunciation. So you have to read the full speech. It's stunning. I have, as I said, I have several videos on it, and instead of reading the whole thing, you can watch some of my videos on it. Um, so that Benedict, in that speech, that Benedict reasoned that he could tease the active ministerial role of the papacy away from the interior, per perhaps even ontologically, ont 
even ontological reality of being vicar of Christ. And that's actually what Benedict seems to say, because he says, look, when you're a father, you're a father forever. You're no longer not a father. That's why what he said uh, to one of his, uh, to his German biographer. An office which once conferred, uh, conferred by the uh, by the current legitimate practice, i.e., conclave, and accepted, cannot be lost until death. That seems to be Benedict's idea. So, so basically, his resignation is fake, because no, you can leave an office. It's an office. You shouldn't, if you have the strength to keep it, because God chose you. You have to carry your cross to the end. You can't say, "Well, I'm getting too old. I don't. I don't want to deal with all these problems." I don't go to enjoy my life, you know. No. You're still in the Vatican. Anyways. Um, that's why Benedict defends himself in his last speech. He says, I did not abandon the cross of Christ. Uh, well, you kind of did. So if you didn't abandon your cross and you didn't abandon the, the, ministry, the office you received in 2005, so how come you have the ability to, well, maybe he thinks he had the ability to say, you know what? I didn't abandon the office I received in 2005. I didn't abandon the, cro the cross of Christ, but I gave away the power for governance away. He thought he had that power. Then at least the other guy shouldn't be dressed in white. He should be dressed like a bishop running the, 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 the diocese of Rome in his name. Anyways. So he says... Uh, uh, Hence, if that accurately describes Benedict's thought, if a, pope, if a pope is invested as vicar of Christ, he cannot lose that office, even if he resigns as, as say, the bishop of Rome. That seems to be what he's thinking. Let's stick with this, uh, with the permanent for the moment. There is a permanence in the style and uh, sense of a baptism and holy orders. I won't go through it because that's a different story. It shows you that, yeah. These are like you get an indelible mark, or holy orders, a baptism, confirmation. It's not an office. Um, he says, the Latin of canon law isn't really the place where one expects elegant flourishes. It's legalese, and as such, it's precise. That's why words, words and the arrangement have meanings. Uh, I'm gonna skip that point, that part. Again, very interesting to read, but I will let you do that yourselves. Um, uh, so where is this going? Oh, he talks about Timus. So he says um, after he goes through this whole section, he says this somehow that suggests that somehow being pope doesn't have to be doesn't have the same quality as being the head of head. Being as being head and vicar. Um, so Benedict Benedict may have thought that he could separate ministerium and munus, remaining vicar of Christ, an in interior state of being, while handing over the active activity, the ministry of the Bishop of Rome. That's actually basically what Benedict says. He says, I retain the spiritual uh, functions of the office. He says, I abandon the active exer exercise of the abandon the gov power of governors, governance, but maintained the spiritual. You cannot half resign. Um, however, it seems to me that it is, uh, that it is sometime, something that Benedict suggested oh, that once conferred uh, the state of being vicar of Christ was like to similar to an ontological mark on the soul, and I did a whole video on that. You can watch this. I am ontologi I am an ontologically pope. That's I think the name of the video. Benedict. <laughs> like, I'm a father. I'm a father forever. You know the sons grow up and then they run the business, but I'm still the father. Um, and then he talks about Vatican I, that they were they had a lot of questions about the office of the papacy, the Petrine office. Is the Petrine office absolutely and intrinsically, in, inextricably bound up with being the Bishop of Rome? That was one of the questions. Um, so again, he talks about this, uh, that basically Peter was the vicar of Christ even before he was a priest or a bishop, before the Last Supper. 
Christ designated him as, as the rock. Peter, who, was, who had an inward monus, then also had an active ministerium that flowed from the enduring monus after he became... Um, um, after Jesus reappeared to him and told him, feed my sheep at that point. So um, I don't want to read every word. I want you to. to, to, to. Um, then later, Peter went to Antioch and founded a church. Even later, Peter went to Rome, where he died. Uh, a new vicar of Christ was chosen in Rome, thus sealing the deal. Peter's successor is both bishop of Rome and vicar of Christ. He has both the inward munus and the outward ministerium. So another question, but is being vicar of Christ absolutely bound up with being bishop of Rome? That's another question. Um, the fact remains that, that Peter was vicar of Christ before he was ordained, before uh, he left the Holy Land, before he went to Rome. Being bishop of Rome and vicar of Christ were not in an absolute sense tied together. Um, they got tied together when Peter died in Rome. But is that an absolute necessity? That's the question. But, again, I'm skipping some because I can't really go through every word. Um, if it is really possible to resign the ministry of Peter, Bishop of Rome, um, you know what, I'm going to... Because... Okay, maybe I'll continue, then I have a couple of things I want to tell you here. So anyways, uh, but if, is it if it is really possible to resign the ministry of Peter bishop of, as Bishop of Rome without resigning the office of the Vicar of Christ, and if that is what Benedict intended, then in 2013 the Cardinals elected the Roman Pontiff, their bishop, and not the Vicar of Christ, that office still sticking stubbornly to Benedict's. Now, maybe I'll mention it now before I kind of forget. And actually, where he talks about the Cardinals, again, it talks about the election, was he imposed. I did a video on, there are several books on the subject, actually. Um, there's, I did a quick video on this. I just did a certain portion, Keys, the Keys to the Kingdom, and how the British government uh, collaborated in the election of Jorge how the British embassy was used to invite cardinals so they can basically coordinate the election of Jorge. And I have another book by a, a true Jorge worshipper, um, The Election of Francis, Gerald, Gerard O'Connell. And I did a full review of that book. And um, it's really interesting. And it talks about the ballots and the counting of the ballots. And because... Because Antonio Sochi, which again I did a review on that book, uh, again he talks about Benedict, about uh, the extra ballot in the election of Francis. Because Francis, anyways, he was heading towards victory. Uh, but uh, there was an extra ballot counted contrary to the rules of the conclave. You can watch the video, I'm not going to go over it now. Now, one last thing before we go get back to Father Z. Father Z, throughout this big article, doesn't mention a very important study, which I again mentioned previously in another video, uh, of a professor of uh, canon law um, in Lugano, Switzerland. I he, think published it in either 2000, 2013 or 2014. So, and uh, you can find it online if you search for it. Uh, here it is. The resignation of Benedict XVI uh, between history, law, and conscience. And the author is Stef Stefano Violi, Theological Faculty of Familia Romagna, Faculty of Theology. Uh, of theology. So, and I just printed here just uh, three pages of it, but it's like, I think, ten, uh, I think it's 10 or 11 pages total. It has a ton, ton of history, and it goes through the history of all the popes, and was uh, any bishops even resigned? Basically, the people, who, bishops who resigned, nobody resigned at 75. This is an innovation of, 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 of Paul VI, and he did it to get rid of the conservative uh, bishops and cardinals, so he can impose his own uh, new new cl clan to elect a new pope to, uh, to his liking. 
that's an innovation. It was has no basis in history or or, or theology. A, a pope is a bishop. It's not just simply a father of his diocese. You can't say, okay, you're too old, father, get out of here. No. Um, so this is an overreach of the papacy. Um, and uh, and the only time bishops would resign was of, I don't remember the full, he gives one or two occasions, but basically it is for heresy. If suspected of heresy, then that is when they were deposed or removed. That's it. And he gives talks about the popes who resigned. Again, there is, again uses very technical terms, very clear to Latin terms, ex explaining. And where does it, can, can a pope even resign? Because in the early church, a pope to resign would be impossible. It's a heretical, it's, you cannot resign. You were given that office, you have to keep it till the day you die. But anyways, um, I, I can't remember which, which pope uh, said, no, no, it's an office, the pope can resign for, for legitimate reasons. And, but again, he gives the example of a resignation. He says, look, he resigned here, clearly the papacy. These are the rules of resigning, the whole papacy. Benedict did not resign the papacy. That's why he's still called Benedict. That's why he still wears white. That is still why he gives the apostolic blessing reserved only for the Pope. Um, so, uh, and actually that's basically what uh, what Gonswein says. He gives you actually the reasons why he still dresses in white. Why he still gives the apostolic blessing. And why he's still called Benedict. Why you still have to call him Holy Father. Gonswein says that in his full article. You have to read it. So, so uh, so this is so basically it's a big long article as I said but anyways again he goes through ministerium and munus so again faculty of theology uh, doctor of canon law professor uh, so and in his conclusion um, I again I did the whole video on it he says uh, after he proves basically in 10 pages that Benedict did everything contrary to tradition he goes into his mind flip and he goes uh, on february 11th 2013 in full harmony with the tradition of the church even though he said every word for 10 pages before it proving it is not in harmony with the tradition of the church but let's ignore that fact benedict the 16th declared his renunciation of the petrine ministry concerning the dictate of the canon he, however, concerning the dictate of the canon, however, he declared his renunciation not of the office, the munus, but of its administration. So Benedict did not renounce the office, but its administration. A renunciation limited to the active exercise of the munus constitutes the absolute novelty, this is his words, so how can it be in, in conformity with tradition? The absolute novelty of the resignation of Benedict the Sixteenth. So at, at the juridical level, meaning the law, for like based on canon law and the law, at the juridical base of the decision is not then canon 233 number 2, which governs the renunciation of the office. Uh, of the office, different from that pronounced by Benedict the Sixteenth. So here we go: a professor of canon law, professor of theology, 2014, explicitly and unambiguously makes clear what Father Z is now saying. No, Munus and Miserium, two different stories. And anything in the past, when a pope resigned, he resigned the whole, the whole meal deal the whole thing not just part of it not so this is the study you can found find the full full thing online you can download it and read it yourselves uh, so anyways let's continue with father z here because i don't want to be too long but hey i'm entertaining aren't i i i'm a storyteller um this is important but i try not to dwell on it too much because I did enough videos on it, so I wasn't planning on doing any other videos on the subject because what I have is more than enough. But since Father Z brought it up, hey, let's delve into it one more time. All right, so, uh, but if, it, if, 
if it is if it really is possible to resign the ministry of Peter as Bishop of Rome without resigning the office of, P of Vicar of Christ, and if that is what Benedict intended, then in 2013 the cardinals elected the Roman pontiff, their bishop, and not the Vicar of Christ. The title which Francis removed and put as a historical title. That office still sticking stubbornly to Benedict. Back to our scenario of Pope Silverius and Pope Vigilius. So I mentioned that, the Dom Guéranger solution. So, and he's like, uh, he does actually say it in a kind of a funny way here. Uh, oh, it doesn't matter, I'm not gonna, you can, I basically told you what, what the idea is. Um, Okay, let's just skip that here. Remember, Pope is just a word, a title. It's not magic. It's not magic. There are various Popes. As I said, the, the, the Patriarch of Alexandria is called Pope. Pope Theodorus now. Uh, and there was Pope Shenouda before him. There are various popes in various churches. Don't get caught up too much with that one word. Okay, however, if, as some people think, the offices cannot be separated, then Benedict was in substantial error because he thought he could split the papacy between the active and the contemplative. One can do the functions of the papacy, but... Uh, still, the other one can remain Pope. Um, so he was in substantial error about what he was trying to do. That is Anne and Edward's position. Being in substantial error about the terms, the terms of his resignation would mean that the resignation itself was invalid. Because if he tried to do the impossible, a thing which he did not have the power to do, it, the divine constitution of the church, the divinely up, uh, um, instituted office of Peter, of Pope, of Supreme Pastor of the Universal Church, he tried to do an expanded ministry, and as Gonswine himself in his speech says, uh, that the papacy is no longer the same after Benedict XVI. He changed the, the, the papacy, the office of the papacy. He expanded the, pap the office of the How could, He doesn't have the power to do so. No pope has the power to do so. So that's the substantial error part, argument. Another argument for the invalidity of the resignation. Therefore, if all that is right, actually, before I continue, oh, let's, let's do the conclusion. Now, therefore, if it, all that is right, should Benedict go to God before Francis, then the office of Vicar of Christ might mysteriously, a la Dom Guéranger, Attach itself with the Francis Bishop of Rome. Or as I said, it could just continue. He's dead. Um, and Francis is just an administrator. So he continues as if any pope dies. The Camerlengo, I think it's, he's called, just runs the Vatican, runs the church until a new pope is elected. So Francis would continue running the church, appointing bishops, uh, uh, you know, uh, appointing cardinals. And they'll still be valid because he's the administrator. And he was given that authority by the vicar of Christ who just passed away. So, and when he dies, then a new pope can be elected. So, anyways, but, but the Don Guéranger solution is like magically the title of Vicar of Christ go from Francis, from Benedict, gets stuck to, to Francis by magic. If that doesn't happen, then the office of Vicar of Christ would be empty, as it is normally between pontificates until Francis should die. And the College of Cardinals elects a new bishop of Rome, who will then also be, because of the powerful bond between being vicar of Christ and Roman pontiff, both, both, again, in one person. Who? And Father Z had another, another um, article a while back, and he talks about the vision of Fatima, the, even the one released by the Vatican, um, where, where Sister Lucia describes... And like they go through the city, it's all like destroyed image of the church, basically. And they see this bishop dressed in white. And Francis calls himself the bishop dressed in white. He went to Fatima and called himself, I am the bishop dressed in white. Anyways, so they see a bishop dressed in white and they say, he seemed to us to, he, he, he seemed to us to be the Pope 
it was kind of unclear and it was like seeing somebody in a mirror so father z there says first of all he's they, they don't they're not 100 percent it's a pope it's a bishop dressed in white he looks kind of like a pope it's like a vague it's kind of like seeing something in a mirror and in fact father z comments it's like it's a mirror it's like a reverse image like a like a an image of a pope but it's not the pope so it's like almost an you know um I don't want to say anti-pope, but kind of a pope replacement. It's like a, because they see this image, like in a mirror, like a reverse image. So he mentioned that. I can't remember the exact words he used, but but that's the thing he mentioned. Anyways, uh, that said, if Benedict did the resignation properly, so as to resign the whole shooting match, of course, which of course he didn't, otherwise there would be no no problem. If he said, I resigned the papacy and here you go, bye bye, I'm gonna wear my black cassock and go to Germany. End of story, finished, no, no, no big deal. No, 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 he didn't say that. He said, No, I, I resigned uh, the, the, uh, the, 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 the munus I received, but I resigned the ministerium of, uh, of the exercise. The ac and he explains it before he actually leaves off, uh, office. He leaves the exercise of the office, let's be clear. Uh, it, in his speech in the Vatican, his last speech, he says, I, the, the office I received from the hands of the cardinals, 2005, it's always and forever. Irrevocable. Oh, he says this, my, this is the, what he, the words he uses. I think he, uh, Father Z calm uh, message says, this, um, my decision uh, to renounce the active ministry does not revoke this, does not revoke his acceptance of the office in 2005. That's what he says in his last speech. Can you, can you fathom what's, being, what's happening here? That said, if Benedict did the resignation proper, properly, which he didn't, so as to re resign the whole shooting match, then all that all of this is moot. Francis is both Vicar of Christ and Bishop of Rome. But of course, Francis doesn't like that title. He put it as a historical title. It doesn't have anything to do with me. Uh, whether or not those offices are can be separated, that's the majority position, as you know. Anyways, uh, historically, there were long periods of time when the see of Peter was empty. He gives examples. Uh, historically, there were long periods of time when the Vicar of Christ was not in Rome gives examples. Um, I'm going to skip a bit. Let's be clear. Let us be clear. The, uh, the Petrine office is, is a necessary constitutive uh, part of the church as Christ founded it. So it cannot be altered. It cannot be expanded. It cannot be changed by a pope to alter the Petrine office. As Gonswine says, Benedict attempted to do. In short, in the short term, it can be interrupted, but in the long term, indispensable. The church is indefectible. And therefore, there will always be, till the end, a successor of Peter, a vicar of Christ. And again, successor of Peter. Again, that title, Francis removed from the pontifical yearbook. I don't want to be called successor of Peter. I don't want to call the vicar of Christ. I don't want to be called pastor of the universal church, supreme pastor of the universal church. I am the Bishop of Rome. That's it. At this point, you might be wondering what practical effect this has for your life. It basically says, stick with a good priest, go to a good church. And, you know, a lot of people didn't even know what the name of the Pope was in years before. We have no power over a lot of things. So we can't be stressed out over things we have no power over. If Francis is naming all sorts of cardinals, but Francis isn't the Pope, then will the conflict clave be legit? Yes, because we already he thought, dealt with that point previously. First of all, that he brings all the cardinals to, to Benedict to approve. Secondly, uh, Benedict basically gave him the power to appoint the cardinals. Thirdly, if he's just the Bishop of Rome, he's just appointing Roman clergy, who chooses the Bishop of Rome. So it's still legit. So no matter what, <laughs> they're legit. So anyways, uh, think of it this way. Uh, uh, it is Francis can name cardinals because cardinals are the clergy of Rome. That's why they have Roman churches. 
naming cardinals as the function of the Bishop of Rome. Even if both Benedict and Francis should go to God, there is still a college of cardinals, the one whom they would elect, uh, uh, Benedict, Benedicto Franciscoque defunctis, meaning they're both dead, <laughs> would be the true pope. Uh, anyways, um, I think we're almost done here. There's a few theories about why he resigned. Now, now he talks about the theories of Benedict's resignation. And actually, uh, Dr. Taylor Marshall's book, which I did a review on, uh, does talk about a whole bunch of things from the Vatic Vati leaks, uh, a whole bunch of things, which, and even the... Um, they shut down all the financial banking in Rome. And they, as soon as Benedict resigned, boom, he announced his resignation, boom, the, the bank machines all start working. Magic, magic, magic. No pressure. No duress. It's all free. Anyways, you should read Taylor, Dr. Taylor's Marshall book, Infiltration. There are a few of these theories. Firstly, um, firstly, uh, he didn't feel up to it. He don't have the strength anymore. But he, you know, he lived, what, how many years? It's 2013. You know, we thought Benedict was going to die in a year. But he has some terminal illness. He's going to be dropping dead in two seconds. But he's still alive. And apparently his brain is working pretty good. Um, definitely better than Francis, anyways. Um, for example, again, there could have been monetary concerns. The Vatican Bank. Internal corruption. The gay mafia. Or, and maybe worried about his health. He was worried about his health and he'd be like in a vegetative state and all those around him are running things in his name. Uh, like what happened kind of to uh, John Paul II, but at least John Paul II had a Ratzinger. Uh, but, but that was the problem. That is the problem with Benedict. He kept his enemies close. He did not purge them like Francis is doing. He kept those who theologically were modernists who hated his guts in their seas he kept he was a peaceful man but that was he kept them so they kept his the pressure on him he kept all the enemies of a lot of his enemies or enemies of the church enemies of truth in positions of power i mean not not uh, not a smart move now they got him out of there the saint gallen mafia Sankt Gallen Mafia. Oh, that's another thing for the election of Francis. And the, the Gonsman talks in 2005, there was a fight between the Sankt Gallen Mafia and another group, the Sankt Gallen Mafia, in 2005, were still pushing for Francis, for Bergoglio. Bergoglio. He says, remember, Canon 188 says that a resignation made in a state of grave fear inflicted unjustly would be invalid. So if Benedict was under pressure, even though he says, oh, we did it freely, um, anyways, if Benedict has been under pressure by powers that control banking or if he was being threatened about a dos dossier or even matters concerning his brother, then he was under duress and the resignation would have been invalid. Perhaps he did so willingly, but so will but, but so willed because he was under duress. <laughs> he would, I did willingly, but yeah, I willed it because I was under duress. Uh, so anyways, um, I'll let you read some of it yourself. So if Benedict intended, here comes the speculation again, if he intended to do bifurcate, meaning to split uh, into two, the papacy and remain the vicar of Christ while letting go of being actively the bishop of Rome, then perhaps his use of ministerium rather than munus was kind of a breadcrumb which he knew people would eventually follow. Thus, at the, at the time he was being forced out, he left a telltale signs that he was under duress. That would mean that he wanted people to figure out that his resignation was invalid. Remember, if a pope doesn't resign willingly, his resignation is invalid. If the pope has in mind some sort of pap project papacy, like Gonswine actually says, like bifurcated or expanded between ministry or whatever, and the project is in fact impossible, then the Pope is in substantial error and the resignation is invalid. Canon 188, a resignation makes made out of grave fear that is uh, inflicted unjustly or out of malice, substantial error, 
or simony is invalid by the law itself. So we don't need anybody to tell us it was invalid. By the law itself, it's invalid. So you're still Pope, or you're still um, Vicar of Christ, Bishop of Rome. It's by by the law itself, it's invalid. And as I said, in the, in the renunciation of Benedict, he doesn't renounce the office. He renounces the active exercise of the ministry. Either way, duress or error, Benedict would still be Pope in the sense, in that's important, in the sense of being Vicar of Christ, which is the important one, for sure. And perhaps also, perhaps as Bishop of Rome. Uh, breadcrumbs. Here's another I alluded to above. And the last uh, general audience of Benedict XVI, which I did, a, again, as I said, a bunch of videos on this stuff. I went through a lot of stuff, word for word. Um, that was Benedict XVI. Remember at the beginning where it's... Um, um, uh, uh, in his resignation, he taught... He, Benedict the Sixteenth mentions the date of his taking the papacy, becoming Pope, and his resignation, which we quoted above. Allow me, again, that's his, in his last audience, last general audience, Benedict the Sixteenth, he says, allow me to go back once again to 19 April 2005. The papal, uh, the real gravity of the decision was, was also due to the fact that from that moment on, I was engaged always and forever. By the Lord, always, anyone who accepts the Petrine ministry no longer has any privacy. He belongs always and completely to everyone. Okay. The always is also a forever. There can no longer be a return to the private sphere. My decision to resign the... So, my decision to resign the active exercise of the ministry, of the ministerium, which he renounced, does not revoke... This, which is, he is referring to here, to April 19th, uh, the, uh, from that moment, which uh, he received the, his, uh, the Petrine ministry. So he says here, I re so his renunciation of the active ministry does not revoke his acceptance of the office in 2005. So basically he's telling you, I did not resign the papacy explicitly right there and he is the interpreter he was still technically both bishop of rome and and vicar of christ so his interpretation of his own action is uh, absolutely you know in you cannot dispute it and Gonswein, his personal secretary himself in that famous speech in 2016 explicitly says benedict did not abandon the office of peter he actually expanded it. He only resigned the active exercise of the ministry. But he did not abandon the office of Peter explicitly. Something, he, Constantine says, which was impossible for Benedict the Sixteenth to do. He says, I don't want to return to private life. So life that's travel, meetings, receptions, conferences, and so on. I am abandoning, I'm not abandoning the cross, which I mentioned before, but framing it in a new, in a new way. On the side of the crucified lawyer, I am no longer. I no longer bear the power of office. Not the. He separates the power of office for the governance. He doesn't say, "I just. I no longer have the. I renounce the office." No, he 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 splits the office. He says, "I no longer bear the power of office for the governance of the church, but I retain the the power of office." in the service of the prayer, and I remain so to speak in the enclosure of St. Peter. So he, he says, look, I'm, I still maintain the power of the office on the spiritual side, but not for the governance. So he's splitting the papacy or the, uh, keeping the vicar of Christ because he says, I accepted it. That's never going to go away. And Gonswine says he never abandoned the office of Peter. Something impossible for Benedict to do. Um, Saint Benedict, and I'll read this again, Saint Benedict, whose name I bear as Pope. So if he's no longer Pope, he should not bear the name of Benedict. But up to today, he still calls himself holiness. He is still called, he calls himself Benedict, which is a name that he bears as Pope. Would be a great example for me in this. 
He showed us the way of life, whether active or passive, is completely given over to the work of the God of God. Breadcrumbs, Father C says, and says. Uh, remember, here he says he remembers that the Cardinal Rossinger, who is Benedict XVI, um, he did a lot of that private activity that didn't have to do anything with his Munus and Mysterium as pre prefect of CDF and the College of Cardinals. And he still dresses like a pope, except that he doesn't use the shoulder cap that is was a sign of jurisdiction, the power of governance of the, of the office, the power for the governance. So he says, okay, I'm not going to be the governor, governed, but I'm going to still be dressed in white, calling myself holiness, calling myself pope, uh, having the cardinals, the new cardinals come and see me, and I bless them, and I give the apostolic blessing. Again, I'm skipping a bunch because it is, oh, here we go, it's the end of the article. Um, breadcrumbs, more time, breadcrumbs. Um, He says, all things shall be well. All manner of things shall be well. And that comes from St. Julian of Norwich. You can look into it. Uh, the Holy Spirit, as, Saint, as Joseph Ratzinger pointed out, guides the election of popes in such a way that they don't cause a total disaster. Thanks be to God. Fallible men elected wicked popes in the past. Some popes were imposed even while others were still alive, which was the incident we talked to at the beginning of the show, of the, of the review. Turning the sock inside out, it would be that even wicked popes were elected under the influence of the Holy Spirit in order to punish the church or to awaken her from a slumber. And I think a lot of people woke from the slumber. And to begin a reform, it could be that the Holy Spirit rigged the election of bad popes precisely to break us from thinking that their very uh, that, that, that their every word and action is more important than it really is. To batter down papalatry, which means pope worship. The Pope said, "You don't have to." fast anymore. Okay, that's it, all done. We're not fasting. We're going to eat him, eat him, eating meat and feasting on, in Lent and, and, and Fridays and Wednesdays. doesn't matter. Pope said it's okay. Even though it's a disciplinary act, it's an apostolic tradition. Wednesdays and Fridays were days of total fast and abstinence in the early church. You can read that in the Didache, the oldest document, even older than some of the New Testament writings, where it explicitly says, Christians fast on Wednesdays and Fridays. Wednesdays because Judas betrayed Christ on Wednesday. Fridays because Christ was crucified on Friday. And they fasted, meaning no food at all, period. Until sunset, they ate some. And no meat. That is, and if it is from even before the end writing of the last books of the New Testament, this is apostolic tradition. And we have to if adhere to it and try our best to do it. Is it so hard to not eat meat once a week, twice a week? And that's just, and people gorge themselves on other things. They're not even fasting. They're just abstaining a bit. No, it's fasting and abstinence. That's for example, you know, no. Oh, Pope said, oh, Pope said, okay, no, we don't have to, you know, go to mass on Sundays anymore because, you know, we might get a cold. All right, hey, the Pope said we don't have to go to mass. We can go watch a movie, go to go watch Netflix or something. Ah, that's better. It's good for our spiritual souls now. Of course not. Oh, uh, the Pope said, oh, we don't have to, we, we can uh, abolish all the ancient rites of the church. We can uh, abandon all the apostolic rites and traditions, even though in the creeds of Trent and Vatican I, it explicitly may, uh, states that we are bound to ancient apostolic rites and traditions handed down by tradition, apostolic tradition. We are bound to them, and we have to embrace them and, and keep them. But hey, that Pope said, oh, we don't, we, can, we don't have to. We can make up our own stuff now, you know, to, we got to listen to the Spirit and follow the signs of the times and make up stuff. No. Or hey, a Pope suppressed the ancient liturgies. Okay, we can't do them anymore because the Pope suppressed them. 
he doesn't have that power. So, so to batter down papalatry, all manner of things shall be well. And that is the uh, long and very good article by, he points a lot of the main, main things, the main points. Um, there are others, but this is Father Z in Father Z's blog. So you can go over it yourself. And, um, and that's it. I hope you enjoyed my little read of the article and my minor commentary on it. And uh, if you're interested in more of the subject, I did, as I said, several videos dealing with it uh, in more detail. All right, that's it. That's all. Hope you enjoyed the video, and I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.